Hello everyone, we are here with Bigfoot investigator and television host Pat Pennypincher. Pat, tell us, why did you ask that we meet you all the way out here? It's simple, really. This area has a long history of sightings, reports going back decades. Have you actually seen the beast yourself, Pat? On a monthly basis. A monthly basis? That's incredible. Look, here comes one now. Delivery for Pat Pennypincher. That's me, thank you. What's that? And why did a mailman just deliver a package to you in the middle of the forest? This is my cryptid crate. It's a monthly box subscription filled with all kinds of Bigfoot-related items. Each month, a new box arrives packed with amazing cryptid-themed items. All I had to do was go to www.cryptidcrate.com to sign up. Wait a minute. Is this the encounter you were describing? Look at this t-shirt. Awesome! I've never read this book before, and it's autographed? Look at this awesome patch! Holy cow, these stickers are amazing! I've been waiting to watch this documentary, and this is the coolest figurine! A Sasquatch watch? No way! It's even got fur on it! This is unbelievable! Alright, cut it, fellas. We're done here. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. I'd like to welcome you to the fifth season of Monsters Among Us. I can't tell you how excited I am to get back into the swing of things. It feels like forever since the last episode. I have several great tales to share with you this evening, in addition to a huge announcement about the future of this program. But before I get into that, it's been a really long time since I've played a story. So... Let's do that. Our first call of the season comes to us from the state of Florida. This is Adam's Call. I've been listening to your show for quite a while now, almost a year in fact. And I felt it was finally time to submit a sighting I had of an unknown creature three years ago. Now, I normally wouldn't submit anything, but I know you're in need of stories since the show jumped from half an hour to a full hour, so here I am. In June 2014, I saw something strange in the Atlantic Ocean while vacationing in Florida. My entire immediate family, as well as multiple relatives, were currently all together while on vacation in Orlando. Near the end of our trip, we chose to spend the weekend on Daytona Beach, about 10 to 15 minutes away from Ponce Inlet. The weather of that day was perfect. The sun was shining, the wind was calm, and there was not a cloud in the sky. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were about 30 to 40 yards from shore in water that was a little more than chest high, and I'm 6'2". We were currently making our way towards Sandbar. My daughter, three years old at the time, was yelling from shore that she wanted me to come back and pick her up so that she could come with. I remember telling her that she had to stay on shore with her aunt because the water was way too deep for her and that she would be scared that far out from shore. As the three of us were standing and talking, about 15 feet away to our left, the water started rippling. All of a sudden, this huge black and gray, and not a smooth gradient between the colors, almost like speckled paint which blended the two, serpentine body snaked out of the water real quick, coiled itself, m meaning it decided to change direction mid-surface break and reversed, and glided back the other way away from us. It moved exactly like how a snake looks in the water. If I were to guess, the body was about three and a half to four feet thick around. All three of us saw no head, just the large midsection of the body. 
We also saw no dorsal side or tail fins anywhere. There was also no tail splash. The only sound was the ocean water hitting its body as it slid back under the surface. I cannot stress how shocked we were to see this thing rise up and then slide back into the water so close to us. I'm in my late 30s, uh, and I can honestly say that it made me feel scared. All three of us instantly agreed that it would be in our best interest to return to shore and not venture back into that deep of water again. For the rest of our beach trip, I went out no further than waist deep. Now I've seen sharks, dolphins, barracudas, manatees, turtles, whales, stingrays, and any other shallow mid-ocean animal you can think of. My family has been traveling to Florida to visit relatives ever since before I was born and we have always spent multiple days on Daytona Beach in the same location, the Sandcastle Motel in case you were wondering. Ocean life is nothing new to me. But this thing was like nothing I had ever seen before. It's been over two years since the brief encounter happened, but I can still see it in my head as clear as day. I have spent many hours looking at books and online trying to figure out what we saw. The closest thing I've found that somewhat resembles what we witnessed was captured on video in 2013 in Sanibel Island, Florida. I'll send you a photo that you can put on the website showing the location of my sighting. It's the general location in which we were standing. The creature surfaced kind of toward the left side. Well, that's the encounter. Thanks for letting me share it. Thank you, Adam. Now, Adam's sighting is significant for a couple of reasons. The first being that the creature was relatively close at the time of the sighting, which could go a long way in debunking certain ideas such as logs and freak waves. But perhaps the biggest significance is the fact that Adam is a bit of a cryptozoology expert. You see, he owns and operates the PineBarrensInstitute.com, a website dedicated to the research of all things cryptid. In addition to submitting his story, Adam also mentioned that his sighting inspired him to create the page, which if you take a quick minute to thumb through, you'll notice is filled with videos, personal encounters, and tons of additional information. Well, as it turns out, Adam's encounter also inspired me. It reminded me of my favorite water cryptid, and what I personally believe to be the most likely of all cryptids to exist. The Cadborosaurus Wilsey, or Caddy for short. I've come down with a bit of a cold, so I'll spare you from hearing my voice and let Dennis Farina of the Unsolved Mysteries reboot tell you about this amazing beast. In Scotland, it's the Loch Ness Monster. In New York's Lake Champlain, it's Champ. There's Ogopogo in British Columbia. And finally, in Cadborough Bay, Canada, it's the legendary Caddy. The thing I noticed most about it was its eyes, that they were big and they were serpent-like. The odor from it was just incredible. It was permeated, it made you want to vomit. It went down and a hump came up, and then it went down and another hump came up, and it was like it was moving. Cadborosaurus, Caddy for short, is the sea monster of Cadboro Bay. Many people believe that this is the carcass of just such a creature. Computer enhancement gives us an idea of what it might have looked like before it was eaten by a whale. In 1937, there was a whaling station in the north part of British Columbia. And one of the whale boats harpooned this big sperm whale about six hours run from the whaling station, towed it back, and the flangers got to it fairly quickly. Flensers are the workers who butcher the whales once they're brought to the shore. Inside the stomach of this one, they made an astonishing find. They came across this incredible snake-like thing. None of them had ever seen it before in years of whaling and flensing. They knew it was something different. James Wakeland, then a 24-year-old blacksmith, saw the creature with his own eyes. I don't know. I got no idea what it is. I haven't got a clue. Never seen anything like it. And I guess somebody thought, well, that's a queer looking affair there. We better get the manager. And he got it brought down and he took the pictures. The creature was about 12 feet long. 
It had a head shaped like a horse or a camel and a thin snake-like body approximately 16 inches around. It has a pair of hind flippers that were webbed together with the tail to form this whale-like fluke, which undoubtedly provided the main driving force for this animal. The whalers sent part of the specimen to a museum. There, the director, Francis Kermorn, dismissed it as the fetus of a baleen whale and tossed it out. But even to untrained eyes, a baleen whale fetus looks unlike the carcass that they found in the whale. If he just stopped and thought, would these men send down a fetal baleen whale? They dissected hundreds of these things out of dead whale uteruses every week. They, they knew what a fetal baleen whale. So that was really not complimentary to these professional whalers. Skeptics claim the photo may be a hoax, but that hardly explains the people who insist they've seen Caddy. William Hageland was sailing in a remote cove when he and his sons caught what he now believes was a baby caddy. Looked like a little garter snake, about 16 inches long, maybe the thickness of my thumb. But it had a little shoulders with little flippers on its shoulders or, and uh, a bit of a neck, not much, but and a head on it with two bright brown eyes looking at us. Hagelin sketched the animal in detail. He wanted to take it to the nearest biology station, but he was at least a day away. Through the evening, I could hear this little thing making quite a fuss in the bucket that we'd put it into. You could see that he was quite terrified and quite put out with all of this. So I felt that maybe if we tried to hold him over a night that he might perish. So I just, uh, to a great deal of soul searching, decided to put it back in the water and leave it be. For the second time, what was thought to be a caddy was thrown back in the bay. With the help of a paleontologist, we applied computer animation to the photographs of Cadborosaurus. A caddy seven meters long would probably have at least 360 vertebrae. That would give it enough flexibility to form the hoops so often seen by eyewitnesses. But unlike a snake, which can only wiggle from side to side, a Cadborosaurus could move itself forward using its tail flute and steering with its forefins like a sea lion. At least six times a year, there are sightings of this exact creature. I was walking my dog lady, and as we were coming down the path to the beach, uh, she was struggling to get away from me. She just didn't want to go to the beach. Finally, I pulled her and pulled her, and she got closer, and as I turned to look down, I saw this face looking at me. And it was uh, shaped like a horse face, and there were eyes that were like a snake. And as I, I looked at it, it looked at me, and then it dropped its head below the cliff. It sort of took my breath away when I saw it. I heard a sound, thought it was probably a whale or something, looked out, didn't see much, and heard it again and saw like a strange head out of the water. About 50, 60 feet away. It had the definite snout with a big, uh, large head. Um, really rocky looking. A really greeny black color, almost like a garbage bag color. It was uh, a very odd looking, uh, looking thing. It had uh, two uh, vertical hoops uh, as we were on approach. We could uh, see that it was moving very quickly through the water and I would estimate to be about 40 miles per hour. And we could actually see through the uh, two hoops. We could see uh, you know, what was on the other side of the hoop, so that was very strange. It was the uh, most unique thing I've ever seen in the waters around here. I've seen uh, you know, lots of different things, uh, but I've never seen something like that. It's just a question of time until somebody a viewing, one of the six or eight people who see it every year, is going to luck in with either a still camera or a video. But it's, it's, it's such a rare occasion that at the moment we can only say the animal is rare, but it's there. Skeptics claim caddy eyewitnesses are mistaken. 
They believe they're probably seeing humpback whales, elephant seals, basking sharks, or maybe a herd of sea lions. Hopefully, the next person to get a hold of a caddy will resist the urge to dump it back in the bay. Maybe then, this unsolved mystery will finally be solved. Of course, you can find a link to this clip and all clips used in the show in the show notes for tonight's episode. And I highly suggest checking this one out. There are a few interesting visuals included in this video that raise more than a few eyebrows. Thank you again, Adam, for taking the time to share your encounter and for putting together such a fun website. Now our next story takes us out of the waters and into the typical American home. This is Jacob's story from Missouri. Uh, hey Derek, this is Jacob. Um, I live in Springfield, Missouri currently. Um, I have a story. I'm not exactly sure if it's really a story, but I, I kind of hope that uh, either you can help me out or some other people will have some ex explanations for me. But um, I I've had a few encounters with ghosts or whatever you want to call it in the past. Um, but nothing really that significant. There were just a few times I thought I saw something or I thought I heard something. Uh, in particular, there was one time I thought that I saw a ghost um, or a, a figure or something. I don't want to call it a ghost. It was a figure of some kind. Um, whenever I had a few friends over, um, probably about five years ago at my parents' house, and I just saw it through the window, I just saw this black figure move across the window. I was standing outside, I just saw this black figure move across, and I didn't really know what to think about it, uh, you know, what to make of it, but I just kind of chalked it up to some sort of weird shadow, but it was so thick and black and obvious that it was kind of hard to dismiss as just a, a shadow, it was just, it was too dark for that, it was, there were too many, too many things to dismiss it as that, but... But anyway, I had told a few friends about it, and everyone had told me I was crazy, or not really crazy, but, you know, oh, that's probably not what it was, or uh, it probably wasn't much of anything, you know, you're just, you have an overactive imagination sort of thing. And to be honest, I wish that I had never told anyone about that, because I had something happen about two or three months ago that has been bothering me i've been I, i've been thinking about calling your show for a while to discuss it but i've been kind of nervous because you know in the past i had said oh i thought i heard something or whatever but this thing happened and it was so serious um to me that it's hard to dismiss and it's hard to you know i don't want to be the the boy that cries wolf even though i you know i've only seen like one or two things uh i just don't want to be the guy who's like oh i'm you know, I'm always seeing something, always, something's always happening, because it's just not the case, but, um, yeah, I live in Springfield, Missouri now, um, my girlfriend and I, uh, spend a lot of time together, a lot of nights together, her parents own a house that she lives in, I have an apartment, but basically live together, and, um, there's one night that her and our dog, Millie, were out of town, and, um, she, uh, she was out visiting friends and I was here and um, went to bed. It was a normal night. I had like one or two beers, just hung out, watched a movie, went to bed, uh, getting ready for work in the morning. And around three or four in the morning, <clears throat> I have this crazy dream about my girlfriend and um, she she was freaking out, but not in like not in a normal way it was like she was almost like possessed by something in my dream you know she was just her body was retching and and she was moving in all these ways that were inhuman and i woke up and i laid there for a moment and i thought gosh like that that was awful and i rolled over and you know tried to go back to bed and i felt uh, a presence in the room and I, I've watched, you know, a number of horror movies. I've heard people talk about, like, oh, there's something in the room with me. I, I feel something. But I've never, ever felt that before. And I always thought it was total bull. 
I always thought it was just make believe, just something people say, Oh, I felt something so stupid. But I woke up and I totally did. I felt like there was something in the room. And so I, w- I kind of look around. I don't see anything, but I just feel it. And I can almost feel it moving. And I lay back down. I close my eyes really tight. And I'm laying there. And right by my face, I hear a grunt. And I freaked out. I rolled over and I just started praying like crazy. I grew up in a Christian school and... Um, don't really adhere to a lot of things they say um you know i i think i'm a i am a christian but uh i don't buy into a lot of the crap that they tried to sell me as a kid in the christian church um i've kind of come to peace with my things but boy it was it was terrifying and i just laid there for like two hours and and the next day uh, probably probably about two or three hours later i went i fell asleep for like an hour and i went back to work and um, I got to work and I'm always the first one there. I have a small office. I got there and I started turning the lights on and everything, but I just couldn't help but feel creeped out, you know, like just kind of terrified that there was something there. There's something following me and, um, nothing's really happened since, but it doesn't make me feel a whole lot better because of that, you know, I mean, I feel... I, I every now and then I wake up in the middle of the night and I still feel scared about it. And I don't really think it was I don't really know what to think. And I'm, that's like, you know, I said earlier, I'm hoping someone else can help me out, but uh it was messed up. It didn't make me feel good. That's for sure. So I hope I can get some info. Thanks, Derek. Um thanks so much loving the show. If you don't post this, that's okay too. So, thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for sharing. Of course, it's not my goal to debunk your story or to discredit anything that you've shared, although there are quite a few reviewers out there that would take issue with that statement. Instead, I aim to offer rational explanations for otherwise irrational activity, and it certainly seems that you'd prefer a logical explanation over a paranormal one. So what I'm proposing here are plausible explanations for what you encountered, starting with the shadow person walking past your window. Now, light plays funny tricks. There are places in my house that light up in very strange ways when the headlights from the street above hit the house just right. So who's to say that the same didn't happen in your case? In addition, it could have been as simple as a neighbor walking past a window while retrieving a pad or lost frisbee. Now, moving on to the grunt that you heard while lying in bed. I can't help but feel that one of two possible sleep disorders could be at fault here. Both of these ailments I've discussed in detail on past episodes, so I'll skip the explanations, but perhaps either exploding head syndrome or sleep paralysis played a role in your strange encounter. As I've mentioned several times, I suffer from exploding head syndrome, although it hasn't happened in quite a while. But the sounds you hear while suffering this disorder seem to be very real, and they vary from explosion sounds to animal sounds to audible words. So perhaps one of these disorders, coupled with the film that you watched before bed, caused these strange events to unfold. But as I always say, I was not there. So perhaps there is more to the story than we'll ever know. Thank you again, Jacob, for sharing your encounter. Alright, before I dig into the rest of the stories for this episode, I want to take a quick moment to share some big news with you guys. As you heard on the last few episodes of Season 4, I'm looking to monetize the show in some way. Now, I'm not looking to get rich, but it would be amazing if I didn't have to pay the near $100 a month in hosting fees out of pocket. So, after some polling and heavy research, I've decided to open a Patreon account where I will offer several levels, ranging from $2 a month to up to $100, and each will have its own level of reward. Now, I don't have all of this set up just yet. I'm hoping to have everything ready to go in the next week or so. But I wanted to let everyone know what they can expect when it finally launches. I will be offering additional episodes. You will be able to choose between one or two additional shows per month, in addition to videos exploring different paranormal locations around the country. You may have caught the video I did at the Salton Sea a few weeks back. Or, depending on when you're hearing this, my video exploring a reported Bigfoot hotspot in the eastern U.S. I have no further details at this point, but that will change in a matter of days. So please keep an eye on the Facebook pages and listen 
for the announcement on the next couple episodes. I'm really looking forward to this next chapter in Monsters Among Us. Hopefully, this will jumpstart something even more awesome. Hello, Travel Channel. I'm talking to you. Alright, thank you for letting me air all that out. Let's get back to the program. Our next story is a written submission from Larissa in Colorado. Back in October of this past year, I saw two lights that I cannot explain. We live in a medium-sized city in northern Colorado, not as densely lit up as, say, Denver. It was about 6.45 p.m. I stepped out back to have a smoke. It had been raining earlier, but cleared up at this point with no clouds. The deck was still wet, so I stepped to the side where it was kept dry by an overhang. At the time, we were in a different house, and the direction that I saw these lights from in our backyard was east to southeast. After I lit my cigarette, I looked up at the night sky, as I always do. I love seeing all the stars and finding constellations, but this night, there was something different. I immediately noticed two points of light in the sky that seemed to be side by side, in equal brightness to each other, but way brighter than any other stars. My first thought was that they were probably two planets that happened to be close together, but I knew I probably would have seen them before or at least read something about them. My next thought was planes, but they were perfectly still with no blinking or different colored lights. They remained the same distance apart, never moving up or down, left or right, or any other direction for that matter. There was no sound and it was a clear sky. So as I stared at them with 50-50 awe and fear, Racking my brain for whatever else they could be, I noticed that they started to dim, super gradually and simultaneously. I stared and I stared until they completely disappeared. The whole experience transpired in about three minutes, but it felt like so much longer. Of course, I tell my husband as soon as I go inside and get a, huh, response as usual. He's supportive of all my murder slash ghost slash UFO slash Bigfoot obsessions, but lacks my enthusiasm and curiosity which is why I love your podcast and others like it. It gives a little sense of, hey, I'm not that weird. Or at least I know there's a lot more like me out there. So thank you for that. Anyway, if you read this, I look forward to hearing what you think of it or if it reminds you of any similar stories that you've heard. Thanks again. I hope this finds you well. Larissa. Thank you, Larissa. I might actually know what it is you saw that evening but there's one aspect of your story that gives me doubts about my explanation. In an early episode, I told about seeing two bright lights in the sky that later turned out to be Venus and Mercury. At certain points of the year and at certain times of the evening, the two planets appear extremely bright and low enough on the horizon that they appear to be flying within the Earth's orbit. I, like you, watched these two lights hover in the sky, thinking for sure that they were some strange military craft or even better visitors from another time or place. But to my chagrin, they were quite explainable. But here is where the two stories differ. Eventually, Google solved my mystery and I moved on with what I was doing, and they stayed there, hanging in the night sky. The lights Larissa encountered disappeared after a few minutes. Now sure, it's possible that a cloud simply drifted over, covering the lights, but there's one other strange detail that gives me pause. When I witnessed the planets, they were in the west to southwest sky. Larissa reports hers being in the eastern sky. Now, I'm not an astronomer, but it seems like she should have been able to see the planets in the same direction that I did, given that I also saw them in the early evening. So, in short, I have no idea what she actually encountered that evening, but I do suggest that she Google Venus mistaken for UFO or something similar and browse through those photos. Perhaps after seeing an image, she can make a better determination. Thank you again, Larissa, for sharing your encounter. Before we move on to the last call of the evening, I have another short written encounter I'd like to share with you guys. The following was submitted anonymously from Canada. Hey, just wanted to say thank you for the great podcast and submit one of my many stories. I live in a small native reservation near Montreal and my reservation is very heavily populated with many ghost stories and things of the sort. I was about 11 years old when this happened. My parents took me out for a late night drive around 11.30 p.m. and we stopped by my grandmother's house. I stayed in the car and stuck my head out the window looking at the nighttime roads. I don't know why, but I felt like I should look up the road behind the car, back to the next streetlight. At first I saw nothing odd. 
Then, I saw some movement, so I focused on that. After a little bit of time staring, I saw a small, maybe three to four foot tall creature with a humpback walking like a zombie would out into the middle of the road and stop under the streetlight to move its head and look directly back at me. It looked crumpled for lack of a better term. I was able to see its spine under its skin. It was having trouble walking too. Now this little thing was a sickly beige color and although I didn't see much else due to the shadows, I did notice it turned back and looked at me. Then went back to its original path and continued into the Finston graveyard. I never knew terror until that evening. Thank you for that submission. This story reminds me of the gnome and little people stories I explored back in season 4. While these reports are difficult to take seriously, they do get reported more often than one would think. Now the submitter didn't describe any clothing that the creature was wearing, nor did they mention if the figure was humanoid or more animal looking which is unfortunate because that could help us narrow down what it might have been. I did have an out there thought while first reading this story, however. There have been reports of quadrupeds, or animals that walk on all fours, walking strictly on their hind legs. Typically this is done as a result of an injury. In fact, there's an infamous bear in the New Jersey area that has been caught on video walking upright like a human. Now if you take a creature like a raccoon, which can already walk on its hind legs in short bursts. Give that animal mange, which coincidentally could also cause it to favor its hind legs if its front paws became inflamed or infected. The result could explain what our witness encountered that evening, an upright, skinny, hairless raccoon. Of course, all that is a stretch, but I gotta be honest here, it's no more of a stretch than a strange humpback creature walking on its hind legs in the Canadian countryside. Thank you again, listener, for submitting that story. It certainly was a fun one to analyze. Okay, I have one more story to share with you this evening, but before I get into that, I want to get everyone caught up on all the new business. Sadly, I did not reach my goal of 300 reviews on iTunes before the airing of this episode. We came about 18 short. But that doesn't mean we can't reach the goal a little late. So if you haven't done so yet, please take a few seconds to give the show five gold stars and a few nice words. The more reviews the show gets, the more attention it gets in iTunes, which in turn brings in new listeners, which also brings in new stories. So it's kind of like a food chain effect here. So do me and the listeners a solid and review today. I have some new merchandise available. You can now purchase a vinyl sticker for your car, computer, trash can, or whatever it is you want to stick it to. These Bigfoot-shaped stickers are the perfect way to let everyone know what your favorite podcast is. So hit up the shop tab at monstersamonguspodcast.com or follow the link in the show notes to get yours today. Now if you have a story you'd like to hear played on the show, give the hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or you can visit the Submit Your Story tab on the site for email and anonymous submission options. I didn't receive many calls over the hiatus, so if you're sitting on one, please consider submitting today. I should add that I'm especially interested in lake or sea monsters, Bigfoot, Dogman, and other cryptic creatures. But it goes without saying that I'll happily accept any paranormal-themed tale. And one last thing. I'd like to thank the following folks for their generous donations they made over the break. Sean M., Teresa Z., and my dad, Dennis H. Thank you all so much. It's through the help of folks like you that this show continues, and you have no idea how much I appreciate that help. All right, let's get on with the final story. Our last call of the evening comes to us from the state of New Jersey. This is Brian's call about a strange backyard visitor. I um, started listening to your podcast, uh, thanks to Blurry Photos. I heard you on there, the one that just came out. And, uh, 
really enjoy those guys. So <clears throat> thought I'd thought I'd listen, and yeah, it's interesting so far. I mean, I'm pretty skeptical, so I don't know that I believe really most of the stuff that I hear on there. But um, you know, anyway, I had a weird incident some years back, and I just thought I'd report it. I mean, I I don't know if there's a rational explanation for this. There probably is, but. So, uh, my name is Brian, anyway, I don't know how to introduce myself. Um, I was in Erial, New Jersey in the spring and summer of 2010 for commercial dive school. And my apartment was just down the road, like, you know, New Jersey's made up of a whole bunch of little townships that are right next to each other. So, I was in the next one down to the southwest, which is called Turneysville. And um, it was like, you know, a lady owned a house there and she turned the basement into different apartments so that, you know, students could stay there. Uh, while they were in school for five months and my roommates and I uh, you know we didn't want to make a lot of noise in the evenings or stuff like that and we all were kind of outdoors guys um, you know I'd grown up pretty much my whole life in the woods and mountains I'm from Southern Cal originally so grew up in the mountains seeing all kinds of unusual animals I've been around an exotic there were exotic animals of all kinds my whole life um, we, we raised foxes wolves wallabies all kinds of things out in West Virginia and I know animals really really well I was a hunter for a while was a tracker um done all kinds of stuff anyway so my friends and I there in New Jersey had set up this little space out in the woods uh back behind the house uh well back behind the development it was just like our little like outdoor gaming area for nice summer evenings you know we could we had a little table that we got out there we could play cards at we had folding chairs we'd take with us and we'd set up a bunch of those ski torches with the citronella in them keep bugs away because you know the state bird in New Jersey is a mosquito so um, one evening uh, it was pretty late the girl I was seeing at the time I mean she was out of the country she was in uh, Thailand with her family and we were having a bit of a quarrel over I don't even remember what now over the phone so I'd run out to our little seating area and lit the tiki torches so that I could talk to her and not keep everybody else in the house up it was like going on 11 o'clock at night probably and I only had like half the torches lit something like that there wasn't a whole lot of light I did have a little flashlight with me but it you know wasn't very powerful and I was sitting there talking to her my feet up on the table when I saw I don't know probably about I would say 15 yards of me maybe maybe 25 um pair of eyes uh, not very large eyes but they were kind of greenish tinted looking at me from out out in the brush, out just outside of the reach of the fire. And I guess I kind of figured it was a fox or a raccoon or something like that, maybe a cat. Um, and so I just kind of stared at it, and I was talking to her. I was like, oh, hey, there's something funny here looking at me. And uh, it just kind of slowly started moving forward. It was making an awful lot of noise in the brush, like, like I don't know, almost like what I would assume a person would sound like if they were thundering through the brush that time of night. Um, and as it got a little bit closer, I noticed that it was just kind of this pale outline that was much larger than a raccoon or fox. We're talking maybe maybe like a Great Dane size, maybe a small person if they were crouched down. But it was moving very awkwardly. Um, I couldn't really make the limbs out or anything like that. It was just you could see like the pale streaks kind of moving around. Um, I could kind of make out that the head looked kind of rounded. Um, didn't see what looked like ears sticking up or anything like that I couldn't really make out good features it looked very slender built whatever it was and it just moved very awkwardly it didn't move like again you know if it was a cat or even a, a dog or, or anything like that wolf coyote they would have moved a lot more smoothly and um, a fox would have been much smaller a raccoon would have been much smaller and you know, in that part of New Jersey there really aren't a lot of animals other than, you know, there are bears that live there, but this was no bear. It was nowhere near that size. And, you know, I just got this, this really strong feeling of it was did not like me sitting there. It was definitely very actively coming towards me. So I just kind of, you know, I told her, I was like, hey, hang on. Um, something's out here. I don't know what it is. Um, and like I said, the thing started coming towards me. Uh, it wasn't moving very fast, but it was, I don't know, like kind of, I like get the impression like puffing up a little bit, like, you know acting intimidating as animals will do and I started hearing like a chuffling sound it wasn't very loud but I could hear it breathing and kind of I don't know I, I've, I've heard my wolf 
have a wolf dog. She's like 90% timber wolf, make a noise like that when she's trying to intimidate something. Um, I mean, she's a big baby, so she doesn't really ever succeed, but she makes like this chuff sound. And it was kind of like that, a little bit quieter, um, almost like a pig rooting around for truffles, but really, really low and, and much more throaty. And so I thought, you know, I'd better get the hell out of here. So whatever this is, it's, it doesn't like me being here. Um, so I just kind of ran back towards the house and I got this feeling like I was being followed. I couldn't tell you if I actually heard steps behind me or if my brain just kind of told that in thinking that's what I was going through. Um, but I got back to the yard and you know, the yard itself was pretty well lit and I realized I had left the freaking torches lit. Um, but uh, it was kind of a damp night, so I, was in the, I don't think there'd been a lot of oil in them anyway. So I wasn't too worried about that, and I just said, you know what, I, I'm gonna go back inside. Um, I went in, went back, you know, down to the basement entrance, went in, locked the door, told my ex what was going on, and she was like, well, okay, whatever. So I, was, I don't remember if it was the next night or if it was the night after, um, I was sitting watching a movie and my buddies went out back to have a couple of beers and sit there in their little spot. And, um, I went to bed and like not even 30 seconds after I closed my door and turned the light out, they came running back into the house saying that something was out there. Something was out there. And, um, I had my rifle with me. I grabbed it and I went outside to see if it was the same thing. Maybe would chase it off or take a shot at it. And I could hear something again, running around in the brush sounded like a similar sized animal to what I'd heard. When I was out there and but never saw anything so we stayed out of out of the woods there after dark for the rest of the time we were in school now that was in 2010 so you know it's been seven seven years right about it was right about this time of year it was right like you know end of July well no sorry it would have been about mid-June so a little over little over seven years ago and I've never seen anything like that again I've researched flora and fauna of New Jersey uh, native flora and fauna can't come up with anything remotely that size um i had told one friend about it years ago and he'd suggested look for you know like they always say wrecked train cars like the carnivals or whatever animals escaping from zoos couldn't find any reports in that time period and we didn't really have anything near that near us like that anyway um so you know i've always just kind of wondered what it was um and uh i don't know so that's pretty much it. Like I said, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a scientific explanation for it. There usually always is. I know that it could be, you know, I know bears and they lose their fur and coyotes and raccoons and all the number of animals when they get alopecia or lose their fur for mange or whatever reason are very horrifying to look at and they look very otherworldly. But this thing was white colored. It was pale. I've never heard of a pale bear when it lost its fur unless it was an albino, which I guess, but... And I, I've I've done some research looking for other stories, and I've you know always up comes the skinwalkers and all those weird unusual things that usually get debunked later anyway. So I don't know. I just know it was really really weird. I've never really been afraid of an animal out there in the woods, and I was pretty scared of this thing. Um, you know, I've come face to face with coyotes. Um, I've had coyotes dog me hiking at night. I've I've run across black bear at night. I've run across grizzlies at night. I've run across bobcats at night that is kind of scary um and i've been all over the world and, and hiked in jungles mountains deserts you know backpacked and, and all that and i mean i'm a diver i'm in the water all the time with large mostly unseen animals um and i've never been freaked out like i was by that thing um so that's my story all right man um hope you're enjoying sunny cal i know the Los Angeles area pretty well. I was living there until last fall and hope you're enjoying it. Hope you enjoy the dry and the heat because uh, there's no place like it, man. Thank you, Brian, for that submission. I'll be honest here. The details given of the creature are a bit lacking, so much so that I am not sure I can even make an educated guess as to what it could have been. However, what was detailed reminds me of a flap of encounters that took place in nearby Delaware in the 1970s. This is a story I explored early in the show's existence, but I think it's relevant to explore it again today. The following video from the After Dark series was submitted by YouTube user Cryptic. 
In the late 1970s, a slew of sightings of a mysterious humanoid caused an uproar in the small town of Dover, Massachusetts. Several teenagers came forward with a strange tale of an encounter with an unidentified being unlike anything that exists on Earth. The strange creature struck fear into everyone who witnessed it. But what exactly was the Dover Demon? On the night of April 21st, 1977, just outside the town of Dover, Massachusetts, 17-year-old Billy Bartlett and two friends were driving down a dark road when he spotted a small figure moving near a stone wall. As the car's headlights illuminated the figure, Billy noticed that the creature staring back at him didn't resemble any animal he had ever seen before. He described it as having a baby's body with long arms and legs as well as a large head. It had two large orange eyes, but no other discernible facial features. Bartlett returned home and made a drawing of the creature that he showed to his father. They decided not to go public with the story of his encounter, fearing that he would be ridiculed. Fifteen-year-old John Baxter was walking home from his girlfriend's house when he noticed the silhouette of a small person slowly walking toward him as he neared the intersection of Miller Hill Road and Farm Street. Baxter noticed that the childlike figure had an unusually large head. It stopped in its tracks and they stared at each other. Baxter called out to the creature. Who, who is that? Who goes there? Baxter stepped forward and the creature fled into the forest. He followed it until he became too tired to continue. Just as he was about to head back, he looked up and across a small brook, he noticed the creature staring back at him as it leaned against the tree. He could now see its large eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. So I finally got the thought that maybe it wasn't as safe as it looked, because the way it was staring at me, it just seemed like it was, I don't know. I got all these feelings that it was thinking to itself or waiting to spring or whatever, you know. Baxter ran back out of the forest in a panic. When he got home, he sketched the creature. His sketch closely resembled Bartlett's drawing, but unlike Bartlett, he showed his drawing to authorities. Eighteen-year-old Will Tainter and his girlfriend, fifteen-year-old Abby Brabham, were driving down Springdale Avenue when they noticed a small creature near a bridge. At first they thought it was an ape, until they noticed it had glowing green eyes. They described it as being hairless with a large head. Brabham's sketch and description of the creature was remarkably similar to the drawings made by the other witnesses, except for the eye color. Billy Bartlett eventually came forward with his story and the encounter drew national attention. Many people derided the story as a hoax, while others believed that the teenagers really saw something unusual. Because of the creature's resemblance to the popular depiction of grey aliens, many UFO investigators have claimed that it could have been an extraterrestrial. It's worth noting there were no reports of lights in the sky during the three days the creature was encountered. A common theory is that what the witnesses really saw was a moose calf whose eyes were illuminated by the car's headlights. Moose calves have a similar anatomy to what the witnesses described, however moose didn't exist in Massachusetts at the time. In 2006, William Bartlett gave an interview to the Boston Globe in which he claimed that the sighting was never a hoax, that he really did see something unexplainable that night. Other people have come forward in the years after the initial sightings, claiming to have had encounters with the Dover Demon. But whether the creature really was something out of this world, or just a local urban legend, will remain a mystery for now. Of course, there are decades and perhaps hundreds of miles between Brian's encounter and the sighting of the creature that later became known as the Dover Demon, a moniker assigned by famed cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman. 
but the similarities are too great not to at least explore the option that the two creatures could possibly be one and the same. Pale skin, short, upright body, glowing or reflective eyes, and in a relatively close proximity to one another, at least in geography. Perhaps, whatever the Dover Demon was, it decided to come back for one more visit. A visit to nearby New Jersey. Thank you again, Brian, for sharing that interesting encounter. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. I want to thank the amazingly talented Warren Pon Abbott for his vocal contributions on this episode. I'd also like to thank Addie Lloyd for her help with the Facebook pages. Music from tonight's episode was provided by Mayu, anti Tector, and Nature World 1986. Thank you all for listening, and until next week.